So rocks. Rocks are pretty great. I enjoy a good rock. They've got all kinds of cool stuff in them, like metals and things. And some rocks have things in them that I need, like uranium for my nuclear arc, my cool organometallic project where I want to make octafeno uranocene. But to make that, I need uranium tetrachloride. And I can't seem to buy that anywhere. Isn't that so weird? But as a chemist, I am not held back by this very weird and odd supply issue of uranium compounds, as I can shape any molecule to my will. So I can just turn a rock into uranium tetrachloride. So to buy my rock, I went online and bought a small rock that contains mostly uraninite, which is uranium dioxide and partially triuranium octoxide. So after it was very surprisingly held at customs for almost a month, I received it in good condition. It is quite small, but it should contain enough uranium for my project. The total weight of the rock is 5.51 grams, and it seems to be mostly pure uraninite, which is the black part. Before I measure the radiation from the rock, I will do a background check to measure the normal radiation levels at this location. So the background radiation is between 10 and 20 CPM here, which is only from beta and gamma particles, since this device cannot measure alpha particles. Now, uranium only decays by emitting alpha particles, and uranium is also pretty stable, so it doesn't give off that much radiation when pure, especially if it has been depleted. But this is natural uranium, and thus is a little more radioactive. And also, it contains the daughter nuclei, that form from uranium after it decays, which themselves decay and emit beta radiation. So what we can measure here with this detector is only the beta and gamma radiation that is emitted by the rock. Since the daughter nuclei of uranium emit relatively little gamma radiation, we are detecting pretty much only beta radiation from daughter nuclei and nothing from uranium itself. So we see the rock is pretty radioactive, but in reality it might be twice as radioactive or even more if you could measure the alpha particles. Since beta radiation does not penetrate very well through material, it has to be measured quite closely. And since there is barely gamma radiation let off, the measured radiation level decreases very quickly with distance, and with material in between. Outside of the body, uranium is pretty safe. Alpha particles are high energy, but cannot penetrate the skin. And beta particles don't have very high energy, and also don't penetrate that well, but can still reach into the skin. The largest danger is uranium inside the body, but I am not planning on eating or inhaling any of it, so I should be fine. Anyhow, before I can use a rock to make uranium tetrachloride, I have to prepare a reagent to do so, which is hexachloropropene, and it takes two steps. So I set up a large flask with a stir bar and submerge it in an ice bath. I then add 230 grams of anhydrous chloroform, which will act both as a solvent and reagent. I then add in 166 grams of tetrachloroethylene as a second reagent. Then as the catalyst, I add in 33 grams of anhydrous aluminum chloride. I leave it to stir for one hour in the ice bath to contain any exotherm and allow aluminum chloride to start its preparations. And afterwards set the flask in a heating mantle. I attach a condenser and heat the mixture to 100 C. Over time, the mixture gradually becomes darker and an exothermic reaction is taking place. It starts to boil vigorously and I have to take it off heat so that the condenser can contain it. After a while, it tames down and I set it back in the heating mantle, and let the mixture reflux overnight. In the reaction, aluminum chloride catalyzes the reaction between chloroform and tetrachloroethylene to form 1112233 heptachloropropane. In more detail, the aluminum chloride will coordinate to a chlorine atom from chloroform and increase its electrophilicity. This allows the electron-rich double bond of tetrachloroethylene to attack the chloroform carbon, after which the tetrachloroaluminate ion is kicked off. The resulting molecule has a carbocation, which can take up the chlorine from the tetrachloroaluminate ion to form the final product, 1112233 heptachloropropane, and regenerate the aluminum chloride catalyst. When it is done, the mixture is black, and some aluminum chloride has crusted on the sides of the flask. I let it cool down slightly, and then set it up for vacuum filtration to remove all of the aluminum chloride, and I wash the flask and residue with some DCM. I then dismantle the setup and add water to the filtrate, which will destroy any remaining aluminum chloride and also take out some impurities. I also carefully destroy the aluminum chloride residue by slowly putting it in water. I then set up a separatory funnel and pour in all of the filtrate water mixture. I mix them around and we see the dark color disappear. I return the organic layer and wash it once with more water. 
we can already see the product crystallizing in the beaker from some evaporating residual solvent. I separate the layers again and then wash the organic phase once with some brine, which will take out most of the remaining water. I then take the organic phase and add some anhydrous sodium sulfate to it to absorb any droplets of water. I set up a flask in a heating mantle and a funnel with some cotton. I filter the organic phase through to get rid of the sodium sulfate again and wash the beaker and filter with some more DCM. I then set the filters up for regular vacuum distillation. I heat the mixture to first distill off the DCM, then chloroform and any remaining tetrachloroethylene. When that is done, I increase heat and insulate the flask and adapter with aluminum foil. After a while, the product starts distilling over as a clear liquid. When it is done, all that is left in the flask is some brown crap. When I let the air into the setup, it knocked up some of the liquid and the product immediately crystallized. I melt it back down and I measured the yield to be 254.45 grams, or 89%, which is higher than the literature. Then for the next step, I move all of the molten product to a large flask and add in 250 ml of methanol. In the literature, they mention it is done at a temperature between 0 and 10 C. So I move it all to an ice bath, but part of the solid precipitates out. So I move it out again, and then gradually add 60 grams of potassium hydroxide, with some extra methanol. It then seems to be stirring normally, so I move it back to the ice bath. When it has all been added, I move it out of the ice bath again, and we see the liquid product at the bottom, and a lot of potassium chloride is suspended on top. What first happened in the reaction is the formation of potassium methoxide. From the reaction of potassium hydroxide and methanol, the methoxide ion is a very strong base, and is able to take up a proton more easily than just the hydroxide ion. Since the reactant has only one proton, it is also the only thing that the methoxide ion can steal here. So it takes up the only proton from heptachloropropane, which causes the bond electrons from the CH bond to form a CC double bond instead. This results in either of the two chlorines getting kicked off. Chlorine is also a good leaving group, and will therefore gladly take the bond electrons to become the chloride ion. This will go on to form potassium chloride with the remaining potassium ion and precipitate out. After this, we are left with the final product, hexachloropropene. After leaving it to stir for a short while, I filter the mixture with vacuum filtration, and I wash the beaker and residue with some DCM. I then move the filter to a separatory funnel in portions and knock out any remaining product that is dissolved in the methanol by adding a bunch of water. I also dissolved all of the potassium chloride residue in water, since I noticed it was really soggy, and soaked up some of the product. I then decanted off most of the water and added the rest to the separatory funnel. On top of that, I add the rest of the filtrate, and again, add some water to knock out any remaining product. I then return the product to the separatory funnel, and wash it once with water, and then once with brine, which we see takes out a lot of the cloudiness. Now I have collected all of the product in a beaker, and add some anhydrous sodium sulfate to absorb remaining droplets of water. I filter it through some cotton directly into a flask, and then set the filtrate up for short path vacuum distillation. First, I distill off the DCM, and then swap the receiving flask, increase heat, and start distilling over the product. I assist it slightly with a heat gun, and after a while, all of the product had come over as a clear liquid, and only some brown stuff remained in the flask. The yield of hexachloropropene turned out to be 190 grams, or 86%, which is slightly lower than literature, but it's still good. So now that I have hexachloropropene, I can use it to make uranium tetrachloride. Now let's take a final look to admire the rock's final moment, before it is permanently destroyed, because I will boil it in acid. Now that we have taken the time to say goodbye, I set up a flask in a heating mantle and add in a stir bar. I then add in the rock, which will be the last time I touch any uranium with my hands. I then add in 100 ml of 60% nitric acid and put on a condenser. I start stirring and heat the mixture to a boil. It gradually becomes yellow and red fumes start to evolve from the mixture. In the reaction, uranium dioxide reacts with nitric acid to produce uranyl nitrate in a large variety of reactions. This reaction is said to be autocatalytic, meaning one of the products that is produced in the reaction also accelerates it. It is thought to be dissolved nitrogen oxides that increase the reaction rate, but it is not known which one exactly and how it works. From top to bottom, Uranium dioxide can react with nitric acid to produce uranyl nitrate, nitrous acid, and water. This nitrous acid can react with more uranium dioxide 
together with more nitric acid, to form uranyl nitrate, nitrogen monoxide, and water. Any triuranium tetroxide that is present can also react with nitric acid, to form uranyl nitrate, nitrogen monoxide, and water. The nitrogen monoxide in solution can react with nitric acid, to form nitrogen dioxide and water, which we see coming off as the brown-red fumes and red color of the solution. Nitrogen monoxide can also react with oxygen, to form nitrogen dioxide. Nitrogen dioxide is in equilibrium with dinitrogen tetroxide, which can react with water to form nitric acid and nitrous acid, which can continue to react with more uranium dioxide. I leave it to reflux overnight, and when I come back, the reaction is finished, and the rock has disappeared. No more gas is evolving from the mixture, and it seems it has all reacted, to form soluble yellow uranyl nitrate. There are still some solid bits present in the mixture, which are probably just common silicate minerals from the rock matrix, which didn't react with the nitric acid. Since I don't want them in there, I will have to remove them. So I remove the flask from heat and let it cool down slightly. I then set up a new flask with a funnel and a regular filter paper. I filter all of the reaction mixture through and wash it with a large amount of water to make sure all of the uranium containing solution is washed into the flask. What is left on the filter is some small orange rock grains, which do not show any radioactivity. So I discarded them. I then set the flask in a heating mantle and attach a short path distillation apparatus. I start heating the mixture and pull a vacuum to about 30 millibars and boil off all of the water and nitric acid. I insulate it with some cotton and after a while, all of the liquid is gone and I am left with a yellow powder of mostly uranyl nitrate hydrate, which also contains nitrates of other radioactive darter nuclei. Anyhow, I can immediately use the flask with the uranyl nitrate for the next reaction so that I don't have to transfer the radioactive powder. So now it is time to use the hexachloropropene that I made, which I stored in a flask in the fridge. So I add 60 ml of hexachloropropene to the flask, and we see the uranyl nitrate is not soluble. To initiate the reaction, we have to heat it strongly. So I attach a condenser and start heating the hexachloropropene to its boiling point, which is 210 C. When it gets hot enough, the uranyl nitrate starts to come loose, and it begins to discolor. Then at once, a violent exotherm takes place, and a lot of nitrogen dioxide is released. The mixture and solid both turn red from the nitrogen dioxide, and it slowly starts converting the solid to uranium tetrachloride with occasional exotherms and bursts of nitrogen dioxide. At one point, the flask fills completely with white vapors. In the reaction, theoretically it is said that uranyl nitrate reacts with hexachloropropene to form uranium tetrachloride, dinitrogen tetroxide, chlorine, and 233 chloride, which forms a balanced equation. But in a study, the main product resulting from the hexachloropropene that is observed in this reaction is 2,5-dichlorohexachlorofulvene, and also no chlorine was noted. So the original equation is balanced, but does not reflect reality, and it is not fully known what all the products are. But with the observed product, to balance the equation, it would require adding oxygen as one of the products, which is not mentioned anywhere. The use of a chlorinated alkene for a chlorination is quite unique, and not something I've seen before. Anyhow, when I come back the next day, it is refluxing normally, and no more gas is seen. Some solids are still sticking to the flask, so I turn up the stirring to get it off, and I'll leave it for a few more hours. After that, most solids are off the sides of the flask, and we are seeing the olive green color of uranium tetrachloride. I take it off heat, and all the uranium tetrachloride sinks to the bottom. When it has cooled down, I set up a Buchner funnel with a paper filter and wet it with a bunch of DCM. I first wash the condenser with DCM, since there is a tiny bit of uranium tet stuck to the bottom. I then filter all of the reaction mixture through to collect the uranium tetrachloride, but it seems some small particles managed to make it through the filter. I wash the flask and residue with a bunch of DCM and then apply a vacuum so that the residue becomes slightly dry. I then transfer it all to a crystallizing dish, but I wanted to be careful, so the camera work had to suffer here. I then wash the Buchner funnel and filter with a bunch of DCM to get out all of the uranium from the funnel and most of it out of the filter. After evaporating off all the DCM, I am left with an olive green solid of uranium tetrachloride, though the color slightly varies, because it can still react slightly with air and moisture, and the impurity of other metals that are also present. The yield of this part turned out to be 6.49 grams, which is 84%, if we assume the rock was 100% uranium dioxide. Now the filter still contains some uranium tetrachloride that came through, so I moved all to a separatory funnel and extracted it with concentrated hydrochloric acid, which will dissolve the uranium tetrachloride 
without hydrolyzing it. We see the green color from the uranium move into the acid. And after extracting the filter twice, no more green color was seen in the extractions. So I move all of the acid extracts with the uranium to a flask and boil off all of the hydrochloric acid with short path distillation under normal pressure. For the last bit, it was going very slowly. So I pull the vacuum to force it all to come through. When that is done, I see there's still quite a bit in there, but I can't get it out normally like this. So I redissolve it in a bit of concentrated hydrochloric acid. I then transfer it all to a crystalline dish, in which set the residue of the other uranium tetrachloride, to which I also added some hydrochloric acid to dissolve it. After evaporating all of the acid off, I am left with the remaining uranium tetrachloride, which turned out to be 1.03 grams. I transferred the solid to a vial, and the combined yield without drying turned out to be 97%, assuming the rock was 100% pure uranium dioxide. This is pretty much the same as the literature, where both reactions are quantitative, also known as 100% yield. Though I didn't dry my powder, and there are definitely impurities, since I started from a rock and not a pure powder, pretty much all of the daughter nuclei should have come through as well. So there might be nitrates and chlorides in there of other radioactive elements, like thorium, and stable elements, like lead. But, in any uranium sample, these daughter nuclei will naturally build up over time. We see it as a very nice green powder, and I can measure the radiation through the vial. It still seems to be letting off about 1000 cpm of beta radiation through the vial, but a lot of it is blocked by the glass. So in a future video, I will use this to make octafenyl uranosine, which is an air-stable uranosine derivative. Anyhow, that was it. Should I do thorium next? Let me know in the comments. Thanks for watching! And as always, a special thanks to all my patrons. See ya.